count myself among the privileged few who have been awarded the good fortune of receiving an education on the hallowed grounds of a school indeed, an institution that has been around for more than a century. But I hasten to add that this education would have all been for naught if we don't use it to do right by our country, by our fellow men and women, and most importantly, by our own conscience. Because ultimately, what is education? I believe that education must be the process where one learns to discover oneself and in so doing, endeavor to improve the human condition. Politics, in its broader sense, is an extension of that education. It is about what is just. It is about compassion. It is about human dignity and freedom. A society stripped bare of these virtues is a society unable to embrace humanity, and a society devoid of humanity is one that is just too frightening to contemplate. When our fellow citizens were detained without trial and were subjected to beatings and psychological abuse, my education doesn't allow me to remain silent. When the ruling clique now devises a horrid plan to tighten the news around the internet through POFMA, my education rouses me. When the Prime Minister appoints himself and his wife as jagas of our sovereign wealth funds with little transparency and accountability, my education angers me. When we see our elderly poor having to rummage through garbage bins for leftovers or clear our dishes at hawker centres or drag their bent and gnarled bodies to collect cardboard just to pay for the next meal, my friends ACS did not educate me to look the other way. When our city is full of crazy rich, rich Asians and where the Prime Minister insists that he be paid millions of dollars a year but yet has homeless citizens making bed at night on the benches at void decks or sleep at 24 hours McDonald's joints or queue up to for free food at churches and temples, my education pierces my conscience like a jackhammer. To see all of this and yet keep my head bowed and my tongue silent is to betray what ACS taught me. Standing up for what is right, fighting for what is just, speaking up for the voiceless and resisting those who oppress us. That is what education is all about. Indeed, one of the biggest issues that bedevils our society today is inequality. The knowledge of the widening chasm between the haves and the poorest segments of society should make us sit up and pay attention. Such a development is not a result brought about by global trends that are beyond our control, but an outcome wholly created by the deliberate construction of an elitist system. How else can you explain the government's single-minded effort to concentrate our top schools in the choicest real estate on the island? Already, many of these schools give priority to the children of former students. Privileged education by birthright, if you will. The remaining places are open to those living close to these schools. I'm sure it's not lost on you that many parents would move to these districts just so that they can get their children into these schools. But how many Singaporeans can afford to relocate to the Bukit Timah area? Now let me be absolutely clear. I am not advocating for us to pare down and pull down our top schools just so that we can claim that all schools in Singapore are the same. No. What we need to do is to stop this very deliberate policy of widening the already pregnant divide between the rich and the have-nots through education. We need to, and can, level up society by doing more, much more, to beef up resources to neighbourhood schools and revamp our education policies to narrow inequality in Singapore. Look, I, I'm no idealist. I'm fully aware, and I've said this many times, that in an imperfect world, we can never have perfect equality, nor is that desirable. But acceptance of the reality of inequality doesn't mean that we succumb to the scourge 
of greed, entitlement, discrimination, and indifference to suffering. Now, I might as well be upfront and say it just like it is. You are all part of the elite. There's no denying it. Among us are pilots and lawyers, medical professionals, senior executives, creative directors, all at the top of your industries and professions. But there is a difference between being part of the elite and subscribing to and propagating elitism. As we climb to the top of the totem pole, we can do one of two things. We can either reach down below us and give a helping hand to those and help pull them up. Or we can slide grease down the pole to make it harder for those to get to where we are. I believe that the latter is not the creed of our alma mater. The best is yet to be, cannot be an aspiration to only us and our kind. It is almost certainly not a call to get rich at the expense of others. The motto on the badge that we so proudly wore on our shirts appeals to our better angels, to stand up for others, not just ourselves. Because if all we do is to further the interests of those of our ilk, then we would have squandered, and miserably so, the years of education that this school has so richly provided. Remember, we were educated to lead, and the best way to do that is to serve. Now, there is another pernicious effect that inequality wreaks. Inequality stymies economic development. Economists at the IMF tracked the Gini coefficient indices of various economies over the last half a century or so and found that high inequality shortened periods of economic growth. Not only does inequality hamper economic growth, it also undermines health and health care of the lower income groups, threatens race relations, and erodes trust between subpopulations. And most importantly, it destabilizes societies. From the fall of the Ancien Regime in 18th century France to the sacking of the last emperor in China in the early 1900s to the modern day Arab uprising, inequality has been the underlying cause of popular revolts. In the recent case of Brexit, the rise of extreme politicians and their followers in the Americas and Europe, and in the present turmoil that is engulfing Hong Kong, all these can be traced in one form or another to wealth disparity, income inequality, and the disappearance of opportunity for the non-elite. What we don't seem to realize is that this same inexorable march towards the deep end of inequality in this country has been going on for the last couple of decades. What is most disconcerting is that this current regime shows neither the inclination nor the capacity to mitigate the widening of this wealth gap. The double whammy for us in present day Singapore is that our economy is at a crossroads. Gone are the days when we can just work harder, cheaper and faster and expect our GDP to skyrocket. In this changed and changing world, productivity and creativity are at a premium. But there's a catch. Unlike the campaigns of yesteryear, campaigns like Stop It Too, Don't Litter, or Use Your Hands, you cannot legislate creativity and productivity. Higher behavioral responses cannot be brought about by more punitive action. It can only come about by inspiring the people and fostering an environment that conduces to happiness and security. But PM Li Shenlong and colleagues have demonstrated zero capacity in this department. And if your strategy comes in the form of getting people to steal each other's lunches, which Mr. Li has done repeatedly, then you don't have a clue in how to inspire the people and to motivate them to a higher plane. Indeed, the current set of ministers show an uncanny ability to mimic 
what has been failing elsewhere in the world. The continued concentration of political power in the hands of a select few, the extraction of wealth from the people, and the inculcation of a climate of fear has resulted in an economically, politically, and intellectual crippled nation. The key ingredient that drives innovation is freedom. Freedom to express oneself, freedom to question, and freedom to dissent. And let me cite chief economist of the Swiss Federation of, of SMEs, Henrik Schneider, who had this to say about our lack of creativity. Innovation needs people to challenge common wisdom and existing structures, curbing important facets of freedom and its long-run costs. Without freedom, there is less incentive to innovate. Autocratic systems, while good at instilling discipline and conformity, completely suck to use the American slang, at fostering creativity. But it is creativity that is where the battle for advancement and progress is being waged, even as our government continues to clamp down on dissent. If Singapore is going to remain relevant and competitive, we don't have much of a choice. We must open up our political system and let power devolve to the people instead of it being amassed in the hands of a few in the PAP. When we say people before profit, rights before riches, and wisdom before wealth, it is not just a fanciful alliteration. It has become a pragmatic guide to govern future Singapore. But change is not going to come by itself. Your Li Shen Longs, your Go Chok Tongs, and Heng Sui Kets, they're not going to wake up one morning with an epiphany and then decide to take Singapore down the democratic path they will do everything to cling on to their power, their pay, their privilege, and their perks. This is why we must stand up even taller and speak out even louder, because democracy is not going to be handed to us on a platter. When we have lived in an autocratic state all our lives, it is easy to become callous and immune to life's inequities to shrug our shoulders, and to sigh that sigh of relief, or of resignation, I beg your pardon. And after a while, these injustices even cease to bother us, and we lose that ability to feel outrage. May that day never come, not with those of us who point to the future and say, the best is yet to be. Thank you.